Good morning and good afternoon for many of you. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator here at Tripwire. I'm really excited for today's webcast, Passing NERC SIP Audits with Tripwire. Today, our presenters will be Jeff Simon, Director of Services Solutions here at Tripwire. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Kate. Uh, Jason Eiler, Principal Services Engineer here at Tripwire. Hello, Jason. Hello, Kate. And Ted Rasur, Professional Services Principal Consultant. What's up, Ted? Hello. Thank you very Hello. much. You're welcome. Uh, they will be discussing how to attain NERC SIP compliance by utilizing the newly released Tripwire NERC Solution Suite in this comprehensive webcast. Uh, and Jason is going to show you a live demo of the NERC Solution Suite to address NERC SIP requirements. So it's going to be a really fun and informative webcast today. But before we start, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, it sounds like a no-brainer, but I would like you to make sure your volume is up on your computer. Sometimes uh, we forget to do that. Uh, so we want to make sure we hear all these important details. If you have any questions throughout the webcast, please use the Questions tab on your console. And we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to rate the presentation, it's very helpful for us. So please use the ratings tab, and you can even uh, put comments there. And lastly, I will be sending out a link to the archived version of the webcast. So if you'd like to share with people that weren't able to make it today or you want to tune in again, you'll have that opportunity. So uh, I don't want to take up much more time. I want to get on to this exciting presentation. So take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Our agenda for today's webcast begins with a background discussion. We'll touch on who is Tripwire and what's our history with NERC SIP compliance. Next, we'll cover some of the larger challenges with NERC SIP compliance. After that, we'll discuss common approaches used by registered entities to achieve compliance. We'll then provide you with an overview of Tripwire's NERC solution suite, followed by a live demo. Lastly, we will conclude with a Q&A session. And just a reminder, you'll be able to submit your questions anytime during the webcast, and we definitely encourage you to do so. All right, next we're going to discuss Tripwire and our history with NERC SIP compliance. Tripwire is a global company with a dedicated focus on IT security and compliance automation solutions. We were founded 16 years ago in 1997, and we're currently headquartered in Portland, Oregon. We have over 7,000 customers in 96 countries, and these customers represent a very broad range of industries, including 46% of the Fortune 500 companies. Tripwire is best known for our award-winning technology. We pioneered file integrity management and we're extremely well known for our compliance and security solutions. We also have a great log management solution, and with our recent acquisition of InCircle, we are now very strong in vulnerability management. So how did Tripwire get involved with NERC SIP solutions? Well, with our strong background in compliance, it was really a natural fit. We launched our first NERC compliance offering in 2010, which included our Tripwire Enterprise product and a NERC-specific rule set. It was a great start. In fact, 130 out of the 1930 registered entities have purchased Tripwire products and services. Now, during the last three years, our professional services team has worked with numerous NERC-registered entities, industry experts, and the regional auditor community. By doing this, we've gained a much deeper understanding of what's needed to achieve NERC SIP compliance. We've been able to create NERC-specific extensions to our products, which include rule sets, templates, custom reports, dashboards, and utilities. And we've packaged all of this with services under the umbrella of the NERC Solution Suite, which was formally launched this May uh, in, in 2013. Now this is a big step forward, but we're not done yet. We will continue to evolve as NERC SIP requirements change, and we're committed to providing our customers with the best possible solution. 
I'll now turn it over to Jason to discuss key SIP compliance challenges. All right. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, the Electric industry, the electricity industry and actually the energy sector overall has a number of pretty uh, significant challenges that are uh, facing it. Um, aside from just the physical challenges of dealing with a very large, very diverse uh, geography and specialized hardware and equipment and processes necessary just to keep the lights on, there's an increasing influence of um, processes and procedures that are being imposed upon the industry uh, to uh, enforce currency and compliance with uh, broader security needs of today's world. Um, one of the key pain points these days is exactly this, uh, passing the NERC SIP audits. Uh, the SIP regulations are very broad. NERC regulations are even broader. There's a number, I think 13 different domains. SIP is only one of them. Um, and this is a very daunting task. Um, regulations for SIP call for both internal and external audits on a regular basis. And uh, unannounced audits are entirely possible as well. Audits can be complex, time consuming, and very challenging. There's a significant emphasis on producing evidence of compliance with each particular requirement. And there doesn't tend to be a lot of gray area in these results. You're either passing or you're failing, period. By nature, the efficiency of um, passing these has to be very high. Power companies don't want their IT and OT staffs consumed with the audit process, and this can be very time consuming. Uh, trying to collect and produce the required evidence manually can be really overwhelming. Utility company margins can be very thin, rates are controlled by PUCs or other government entities, and cost control is incredibly important. Given those constraints, there's still no ambiguity whatsoever on priority when it comes to control systems in the power industry. Reliability is number one always. So this means when implementing security controls and software, these tools have to be rock solid and the, and the uh, controllers need to have confidence their deployment will not jeopardize the availability of the system in any way. And then you have the constantly moving target of NERC SIP itself. NERC SIP V3 is currently in effect. V4 becomes law in April 2014, and that may or may not be immediately superseded by SIP version 5. Um, NERC also has a tendency to uh, clarify and adjust requirements. Um, just uh, two months ago, they issued a compliance announcement that affected 17 SIP requirements. Just last month, FERC issued their NOPR regarding their, their proposal around how the industry as a whole should approach V3, V4, and V5. So, keeping up with these, uh, overall uh, there's been five different versions in the last six years. Keeping up with these changes, understanding exactly what's required to pass at a given time can be incredibly difficult. So, actually that uh, brings us to a question that we have for the audience. Um, Throughout, we have a couple poll questions that we would like to uh, get some input on. So the first one here has to do with um, how your organization is handling the approach around SIP3, uh, V3, V4, and V5. So uh, if you could um, take a moment and select one of the options. Um, I do want to reassure you that your answers are completely anonymous. Um, anything you select here will be shared with nobody except for uh, your employer and your local regional auditing entity. So no worries there. So also violations and penalties for SIP uh, infractions have been increasing dramatically. So not only are the requirements getting more and more stringent, scope is increasing, complexity is increasing, and the fines are increasing. Um, it's common for a first audit to have findings which you have the ability to uh, put together a plan for, and it's, it's a finding, but the fine itself is deferred to provide some avenue 
for remediation to take effect. However, when the second audit comes around, if those same findings are present, then things start getting really, really expensive. And this is um, a pretty significant burden that is uh, not always easy to, uh, to manage in the scheme of all the other challenges faced by the industry. And um, so at the end of the day, no matter how you slice it, compliance is expensive. In any industry, it's never going to be cheap. And with utilities, it's even harder. Available resources are hard to come by. Any additional spend is a big deal because it's not always easy to make the rate case. And with something like SIP that covers so much ground, it's critical to maximize bang for the buck. So the infrastructure itself, uh, shall we say, is uh, mature. Um, this hardware was built to last, and it has for decades in some cases. Remote instrumentation and control is a relatively recent thing, or well, recent as in 15 or 20 years, but it still predates most standard communication protocols. As a result, there's a huge variety of hardware and control systems that need to be secured, and for a lot of it, the concept of security was never considered in the design. So systems need to be retrofit with a variety of point solutions, and these themselves aren't always easy to maintain. So there's another aspect of this um, old school mindset, and it's that security and compliance as concepts don't have a lot of traction in the operations and maintenance teams responsible for these systems. So for a, a significant part of, uh, of the industry, and for, for decades, security basically meant, do you have a padlock and a deadbolt on your uh, remote substation? Is there a fence around it? And that was pretty much the extent of it. That's, that's where the mindset stopped. These days, that's no longer sufficient. So there's two consequences of this. First is these teams need to be trained, which is time consuming and expensive in itself. Uh, and also, in order to put together a viable security and compliance strategy, it's usually necessary to recruit outside help. And this isn't cheap either. And then there's the actual legwork needed to make this happen. Hardening a given system can be time consuming. Hardening 200 spread across several counties is an entirely different challenge. To make this remotely viable, it's critical to have tools that allow you to scale your remediation and documentation efforts efficiently. And it really is easy to get demoralized by this. Um, however, there's the other side of the coin. Noncompliance is even more expensive. What we're looking at here is a graph of the top 20 NERC regulations ranked by frequency of violation. This is over the last five-year period. So given the challenges we just outlined, it shouldn't be terribly surprising that virtually all the SIPs are clustered at the top end of this distribution. Um, really, the only, the only main standout here is PRC5 has to do with system protection and control. Uh, but all the others are squarely focused on operational and network security. So this, coincidentally, is an area that uh, is right in our crosshairs of capability. There's a, there's a lot of value that we as a technology can bring to this effort. So now we can talk about, uh, for a few minutes, some different approaches to achieving compliance. So. A lot of industries that have spent a lot of time tr uh, breaking new ground on what compliance means, how it should be approached, what works and what doesn't. However, the um, industry, the industries don't always talk well to each other. They tend to stay somewhat siloed. And so what happens is different industries have to kind of reinvent the wheel and discover for themselves what works and what doesn't. So. We talk about a few of these that are um, very common, very natural attempts. Um, these are all going to look very, uh, you know, very natural, but there's there's some significant challenges and flaws within each of these. So, one-time compliance push is an, a very common approach. The the idea is let's focus on getting it done, then we can go back to business as usual. Um, trouble is, compliance is not really a point-in-time measurement. It's a mindset. It's, it's a way of doing business. Um, auditors 
really don't, they're, they're not going to be there every day. They're not going to be looking over your shoulder all the time. External attackers, on the other hand, are very patient. They have all the time in the world. So when you're designing your compliance process, a critical question to ask at this point, is it repeatable? Is this something that you can keep doing? Now, manual processes. Superficially, this really is, looks like the cheapest and the easiest approach. It does not require any investment in tools, no automations necessary. You just train your people to behave differently, to, uh, to change the way in which they interact with their systems, to take better notes, and so on. Um, trouble is, nobody's perfect, and no manual process can be followed with 100% consistency. It's just not viable. And during an audit, if an auditor is looking for weaknesses, manual routines are beautiful places to start. If something's automated, if something's mechanized, a few spot checks are necessary to ensure the consistency of that process, and then you can just trust that the reliable mechanics of the solution itself take it from there. When there's a manual process, the potential for gaps is significantly higher. Therefore, those are, those are wonderful places to look if you're seeking out violations. The critical question to ask on this topic is, does it scale? Does your process scale? When you're doing this for 10 systems, that's great. When you're doing this for 500, then it becomes a matter of just manpower resources. And reliability, is it reliable? Then third, we have focus on doing rather than documenting. Now, at the end of the day, it's pretty, uh, pretty compelling argument to say that the critical part is whether or not your systems are secured. Getting it done foundationally ultimately is more important than the documentation process. That is arguably true, but the thing is compliance isn't just about doing the right thing. You need to be able to demonstrate to your auditors that you're doing the right thing. A power company in the Southwest, one of our customers, shared with us that although they were making really good progress on SIP compliance, the bane of their existence was four simple words, how do you know? Even though they had great controls in place, they didn't have good instrumentation or documentation of those controls. So it was incredibly difficult to prove that a control was in place on any given day. So the key question here, how do you know? So to um, help us answer that question, I'm going to hand over to uh, Ted here to walk you through kind of our approach for our solution suite. So take it away, Ted. Great. Thank you, Jason. This is Ted Ross here. I'm a principal consultant on the services team with Tripwire and have helped implement uh, the solution uh, with different customers and help harvest best practices from our team. And I also work with customers to identify what parts of the solution would be best for them. So my comments really come from, from that background. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. So what I'd like to do then is, is introduce uh, what the framework is. And Jeff provided some of that background of how over the last few years we've been working with customers and we've been harvesting that, that those practices and have put it together then in what we're calling the NERC solution suite. And it's really uh, quite a bit, a few different uh, components. Uh, you see those listed out here. So if you're familiar with, with Tripwire uh, Enterprise and Tripwire Log Center, what some of those pieces are, whether it's rules or policies or uh, scripts. Uh, so it just depends on which part of the solution that we're talking about that would have those different components behind it, whether we're talking about Log Center or uh, Tripwire Enterprise. Most of the components uh, do, uh, are, are supported uh, with Tripwire Enterprise or are based on Tripwire Enterprise. And then you can see uh, in the, the dashboard on the right there, that's a, uh, it's typical that we'll have some sort of high-level roll-up representation of a particular control that a given customer is interested in. So, it's a little hard to see the detail there, but in this view, for instance, we're seeing the uh, changes to uh, critical cyber assets and how that's re uh, represented 
at a high level for uh, when their plan changes. And then we see some uh, pie chart color indicators on are we on track for other specific uh, SIP requirements. So again, it'll just depend on which pieces uh, that we're going to mix and match depending on the priorities uh, of the customer. So that's a high level. Go ahead to the next slide. And what I'd like to do is, is use an example of one of the, the um, uh, one of the extensions in the NERC solution suite uh, just to help illustrate what's possible. And I'm going to use, uh, to me, what's a favorite um, uh, for SIP 7 R2, the requirement on ports and services. And so in this example, so this would be a, a drill down report that you could get to from that dashboard on that previous page. And, and you're going to hear us, by the way, kind of uh, harp on ports and services quite a bit because it's a great example uh, to base um, the, the understanding around the rest of the solution suite uh, from. So in, in this report, so we see very clearly with that orange header what the what requirement that we're mapping to. And then directly below that, we see the name of the system for which we're generating uh, this evidence. And in this case, we're focused on, on ports. And as you look down then through the body of that report, you see the ports that were identified as, as being open at the uh, moment of that scan. And then part of uh, what is distinguishing about this solution is that it has the intelligence to not just read what are those open ports, but combine that with uh, customized uh, acceptance lists or white lists, if you will, that have what are the ports that are allowed to be open and what's the justification uh, for that port. And the and Tripwire Enterprise will then dynamically build uh, this report. So for instance, we see port 8080 with its justification and some description and documentation fields as other supporting information around that. Uh, whereas, uh, well, so then just as an example with, with the implementation of, of this part of the solution suite, uh, there's a, a, an initial effort to build out the, the whitelist uh, for ports, you know, for each platform type and their roles. And then at the end of that, you will either have closed down ports or come up with justifications uh, or implemented those, the justifications you have in, in those whitelists. And you'll be in a compliant state. You'll have a nice green pie chart to help represent that. And because these scans don't take very long, and they're automated, they can be very easily repeated. Typically, entities are performing these scans on a daily basis. And because you're able to do those scans so frequently, then if a port shows up that's not on your whitelist, and then we see an example there, that third one, port 443 with Java EXE behind it, if that shows up one day, then you can very quickly re respond by either uh, uh, shutting down that process or researching it and adding an appropriate justification uh, for that. So you're, you're automating a compliance effort and able to have compliance be continuous. And then the really beautiful thing about this is because it's, it's automated, you can do it so frequently, it actually lets you fulfill the spirit of, of the control, and that is to do it for security. So if you can see on a daily basis if the attack surface is changing, that's actually actionable information from a security point of view. And again, this is just one, uh, one of the example parts of the solution suite. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And in this, I'm going to uh, kind of zoom us back out from a very particular part of the solution suite to a, uh, a NERC SIP uh, representation of where we have uh, coverage and we can offer supporting evidence for uh, across these various requirements that are shown here in red. Uh, but in my conversation with, with customers, though, when we, when we sit down and, and work out what makes sense, um, you know, what parts of the library would be most useful. We don't typically start with the, um, uh, you know, going through each part of the library. Usually it's starting with what are the top few areas where the most effort is expended 
or maybe there's a remediation effort underway right now, and, and where, what is that, and how can we help with that? And that's, that's our starting place. But I think kind of a main takeaway from, from this image is just to understand that there is a, a fairly broad um, uh, offering in what we're able to, uh, able to address. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jason to talk a little bit more about the architecture at a high level. Oh, good. Thanks a lot, Ted. So uh, we just saw a, a nice high-level snapshot of the breadth of coverage that we offer. Uh, SIP requirements are very diverse in their scope, and there's a lot of there's a lot of meat there covering a lot of areas. So I wanted to provide some framework to uh, to show how we go about addressing these requirements. So. This solution is built on uh, two primary products, Tripwire Enterprise and Tripwire Log Center. Uh, TE is, as um, Jeff outlined before, unparalleled with respect to um, change management, uh, file integrity, and SCM monitoring. TLC, for its part, is a pretty outstanding um, log management and uh, data retention tool. So by combining these and tailoring the focus of these apps in specific ways, we're able to cover a significant portion of, um, of your critical environment. So on TE, we have comprehensive change auditing. We have continuous monitoring of configuration hardening requirements. We have the reporting in the dashboards broken down by SIP requirement. We're going to see that here in a few minutes. Uh, we have custom element validation and documentation. Some of that ties back to um, the whitelist profiler functionality that uh, Ted alluded to. And we have very broad device support. We cover all key uh, OSs, huge variety of network devices, uh, a lot of off-the-shelf and custom applications. Um, essentially, there, there are very, very few resources that we don't have some way of collecting file integrity and configuration information from. Then TLC, we have a very comprehensive, very complete audit log capture and retention process for all events, normalization correlation rules to detect and alert on abnormal behavior, and reporting and dashboards for compliance proof and forensics analysis. So. Drilling a little bit more into uh, SIP 7R2, again, um, as Ted outlined, this is a very challenging requirement. Um, all your devices, everything within your ESP perimeter, you need to have documented controls for. You need to know exactly what's running and why. Only enable what's necessary enforce that anything unnecessary is explicitly disabled, and validate this regularly. So this is a really tall order, however you slice it. You know, it really is tempting to look at this requirement and interpret it as externally accessible ports, which means that all you need is a firewall and you're good to go. However, um, we've spoken with auditors on this particular point a few different times. The consistent response has been, the approach is not sufficient. The standard should be applied at the individual host level. Quite honestly, the approach, the individual entity's approach to this is, and the validation thereof is between them and their auditor. But from our perspective, from what we've been hearing, we need a, we need a deeper level of control than simply a firewall. Besides, firewalls tend to be only at the perimeter. And this makes sense just by nature. But once something pierces this layer, it could be a USB stick, it could be email, it could be anything. Then the latest malware du jour will have free reign. So hardening every host within the ESP is critical. So how would most organizations tackle this? Well, usually you stick with what you know. It usually means you run Netstat on each and every system, dump the output to a massive spreadsheet, and then start sifting. And then don't forget a lot of the systems are in remote control centers, which means even more legwork to get it done. So all that said, this approach is time-consuming, expensive, error-prone, but it will work once. 
something like that is not remotely sustainable. The only way to keep on top of it is with some manner of automation. So our approach is what we're calling whitelist profiling. So as Ted outlined, there's a uh, formally defined file which outlines the approved ports and services, which hosts those services are appropriate for, along with corresponding description of what that service is, the role that it has within the organization, and then a justification. Uh, this is a very customizable file. It can be tailored to the specific information that you need to present, but uh, the framework is, is very, very functional. Um, so the output is a breakdown of each and every port and service active. Um, this does two things for us. One, it gives us pretty solid, robust documentation for auditors that ties a lot of these uh, uh, details together. And it also gives us the benefit of operational alerting. So that way when something changes, you'll know about it before your next uh, Big Bang audit approach. So uh, this technique is very powerful, very flexible, and it actually can be used in several other areas throughout our solution. So let's take a look at some of the uh, reports and dashboards that are part of uh, that are part of this. So TE itself offers very customizable dashboarding. This is an overall view showing um, broad compliance status against a variety of SIP requirements. We can also have very granular reports that show the current configuration state of any monitored host. This is uh, some of the one we just saw a uh, sample output from our whitelist profiler showing authorized and unauthorized ports. And also uh, there's a big focus on um, file content, the actual configuration files of a system at a certain point in time. What really is in the Etsy hosts file? What really is in the syslog cons? All those can be um, retrieved and archived as well. And it's an immutable audit trail. It's very robust. And now here we have a TLC dashboard. Uh, TLC itself has a broad range of options that can be tailored for specific needs. The one we're looking at here is showing activity related to SIP 7R 5.2, which addresses controls for administrators' shared and default accounts. Uh, so you can see where those accounts are actually being used. There, there's, there's two sides of requirements like this. One is you need to make sure that the host is configured to apply suitable controls around the use of those accounts. And then the other side is, well, how often, so we know that the administrator account has been disabled, or excuse me, it's been renamed and guest accounts have been disabled and so on. But you have to attach that uh, in order to have reliability, uh, excuse me, confidence in the strength and reliability of your controls. You need to ensure that those processes are actually being followed. So TLC closes that gap by showing you where those accounts are being used. What systems is someone trying to log in as guest? What system is someone using the administrator account? And from where? This captures source as well as destination. So from an operational as well as a um, compliancy perspective, this is, a, uh, this is a really powerful tool. All right, so now we're going to uh, actually show you our, uh, show you our solution here. So let me get let me get tabbed over to it and um, see if we can get this up. All right. So Tripwire Enterprise. What we're looking at right here is a high-level change management dashboard. Change management obviously is um, one of our core competencies. Uh, we arguably, you know, invented the file integrity market. Um, about 15 years ago, and our ability to adapt and enforce any change any change process is uh, is very very thorough. So that said, change management is not a in and of itself is not a huge focus in SIP. It's mentioned in SIP 3 R6 uh, that talks about how you need to identify, control, and document any changes that are. Uh, put in place on your CCAs, um, but it doesn't really talk much about 
the mechanics of how that process needs to happen. As a result, our dashboard here is uh, focused kind of on the higher level aspects. We're, we're focusing on awareness of change, on visibility. So we have change rate, just a trend over time for all file systems that can be drilled into. We have um, a dashboard here for maintenance windows. Maintenance window is one of the simplest and easiest controls that can be put in place. And that's, you know, that as, a, as an easy step, that one's a no-brainer. So we have very good ability to report on adherence to establish change windows. And then we just have kind of an overall, how many systems do you have, how many were changed, and how many weren't. And we can break down by uh, file system, by network device, by device type. There's a lot of different slices here. And we also have um, other ways to examine the data, looking at how are these changes distributed across the different applications and platforms you have, which systems are changing the most, and so on. So this is really high level here. Um, change management and file integrity is a very deep topic. We could spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, but, but since that's not directly related to SIP, suffice it to say, um, we can probably go as far down that rabbit hole as you would need to. But for the purposes of this particular solution, it's not really necessary. So we're, we're just kind of hitting the high points. All right. Now let's look at um, another dashboard that's specifically focused on SIP compliance. So here we have um, a lot of things going on. We have our trending and history chart up here in the top right to show your overall history and what direction things are going. Ideally, as we all know, graphs like this, you want them to go up and to the right. Up and to the right is generally a pretty confident direction. Uh, but as, you know, as happens, that's not always quite that simple. And so you, know, you can, based on changes that occur, based on new applications that are installed and so on, new systems that are brought online, new things that are brought into scope, it's important to have an overall sense of where you're at. And so that's kind of what this here is focused on. And then we have um, a few stoplight reports, which just kind of give a, um, these are more operational in nature. These show what the current state of your environment is at this point in time, or at least the last time a scan was run, which in most cases was the night before, or maybe a couple days before. So again, nature of a stoplight, there's not a lot of gray. There's not really a spectrum here. Either you are compliant or you are not. Um, so if we can drill into one of these, we can see the nature of what's making you compliant or not. So again, picking on 7R2 for Windows. Ensure no listening ports exist. Responsible entities enable, is it, shall enable any of those parts and services, and so on and so forth. We see that our XP system is doing good. He's at 100% compliant. He's the green slice there. And we have this other system that was having a little bit of a problem. We drill in and we see that on this particular host, Dropbox was detected and a listener was open. Um, odds are really good that inside your ESP on your CCAs, Dropbox is probably not a critically necessary service. As a result, this here is a prime indication of a system that needs some hardening. Um, and Again, if there are specific exceptions, these criteria can be defined on a per-system basis. We can be very, very granular with this. So in this case, we've determined, all right, Dropbox is installed in the system. Probably shouldn't be, but either way, you want someone to investigate it. That can be done directly from this view. We have a little email option. We can send it off to our friendly neighborhood system administrator. And now he's going to get this email dropping in his inbox here in a couple minutes saying, you have something here you need to go fix. So just from a high level awareness, this can be really, really valuable. So the three main dash uh, stoplight panes that we put in here um, are two different flavors of 7R2, one for network ports, one for services. We have one in here in password aging. These are samples. There's a lot of different controls 
that we can express up here on this level. We just pick these three because uh, they tend to be um, pretty easy ones for people to uh, align with. We also have some other uh, reports here on the dashboard. We have kind of a change breakdown report that shows the SIP requirements impacted by observed changes on a system. So for Windows, you see that you had overall 14 changes over the last week, and you can see the specific requirements that may be impacted by the changes that were made on those systems. And again, any of these can be drilled into and you can see what the ultimate change was that was uh, that bubbled up and caused that particular uh, that particular alert. So we can be very high level. We can drill down very quickly. And now we also have a pretty broad selection of reports focused around evidence generation. Now. The focus here is different. This is not operational in nature. This is a documentation exercise. This is validation of what the configuration was of a system at a given point in time. So this, this is kind of your historical record. So if we pull up one of these reports, we can see that last time this was run the other day on this particular system, here are all the ports that were observed, and the corresponding process description, justification, documentation for each of them. Most of these, this is pretty much all standard Windows, and in this case, the system is uh, had a few exceptions put in there in order for it to fill its role, and it's doing great. And there's there's no violations on that host. This other guy here, we scroll down, all looking good, and we see this here is also the host where we had Dropbox installed. So the re purpose of this report is not to call out whether or not there are successes or failures. This here is an agnostic capture of exactly what is running on the system at this given point in time. So when the auditor says, I want to see, I want, I want you to demonstrate that you had functional controls on the system and you were aware of everything that was running on it three months ago Monday. You can pull up this report. Uh, you can go back to history. These reports, which are run regularly, they can be archived and retained. And you can pull it up and show it right there. Print these out and it has everything all wrapped together. Extremely useful. All right. So let's see. If we peel back the covers a little bit more, we can uh, show you some of our configuration assessment functionality. Here we have. Um, very thorough coverage as well of both platforms and of specific requirement. So we did a very a detailed review of all the SIP requirements, and we looked for places where our config assess functionality can evaluate a system for compliance supporting discrete requirements. So in this case, SIP 7, R5.2, happens to be the same one from the TLC dashboard we saw uh, that describes the controls that are appropriate for default and guest and shared accounts. And so uh, we have a number of reports. Again, we're not going to go too much into that to show you which systems are compliant to these specific settings and why. If they're out of compliance, what are the settings and what are step-by-step -step instructions on how to, how to remediate those systems? That can be done. Uh, uh, so I can be printed out and issued to your security team or your system administration team. Uh, there also is a capability within the tool to mechanize some of that remediation process. But all these are fantastic discussions to have. Some approaches are much more appropriate in certain areas than others, uh, but the tool offers a great deal of flexibility to help you uh, achieve better adherence to these guidelines. We also have our file integrity rules. Um, these are, by, by definition, every system within your ESP is a critical system. Otherwise, it would, you know, that, that's what makes it a CC. That's why it's in the ESP. And so given the clear focus on reliability and on uptime, we need to be very, very particular about what we check on a system 
We don't want to check anything extraneous. It's really easy just to throw a lot of integrity checks at it that capture every conceivable ID, every conceivable parameter, and then decide which ones are important, which ones aren't. Here we take a different approach. We're looking for only the for very, very discreetly, very surgically pulling out only those areas of the systems that are needed to support these various requirements. So we're, we're trying to be as minimally impactful as possible. So um, we could spend quite a while, um, quite a while looking at different aspects of this, but um, given uh, the time, I think we should probably transition back. I know we have a number of good questions, so I'm going to hand it over here to um, Jeff to uh, to wrap us up. Great, thanks, Jason. So before we begin the Q&A session, I do want to recap some important points. First, as you all know, NERC SIP compliance can be labor intensive and the scope is expanding, especially with version four and what's been proposed for version five. Next, the costs of NERC SIP non-compliance are significant. If you wait until you're assessed fines, look at the expense you'll pay, not just for the fine, but also for the mitigation effort. Tripwire offers a solution that can help reduce the labor and expense associated with achieving and demonstrating NERC SIP compliance. And remember the key benefits of the NERC solution, or solution suite. They are continuous monitoring, that's collecting current status and changes on all critical cyber assets. Automated assessment, which is analyzing security data and alerts on suspicious events. And audit-ready evidence, generating reports and dashboards that document your compliance. Lastly, just want to emphasize that we support version 3, version 4, and I know there's different camps on version 4, whether it will be approved or superseded by version 5. And we also support version 5 as it's been filed, but of course with the disclaimer it hasn't been approved yet. Now let's move into our Q&A segment, and we have quite a few questions. So I'm going to take a look at the list really quickly and pick a few. So I see a couple of related ones, which are, what other tools and applications can you integrate with, and does TLC replace or play nice with ArcSight? Jason, why don't you go ahead and take that one? Sorry about that, I was on mute. Uh, in essence, yes, we can integrate very well with a broad variety of different tools. Um, any change management system, uh, ServiceNow, HP Service Desk, Remedy, almost any major mainstream we already have established package integrations for. Uh, we integrate very well with CMDBs, which is incredibly useful for the classification and um, prioritization of your various critical assets. Um, and ArcSight is absolutely a product we play very, very well with. Um, TLC is not nearly as broad in scope or as flexible a tool as ArcSight, but it is a pretty rock-solid focused log management and SIM tool. Uh, that said, we know that uh, ArcSight is kind of the gorilla in this market. We do actually have a certified integration between Tripwire Enterprise and ArcSight, so we can uh, send very rich change and audit information about any uh, any changes that were made, any configuration drift. We can send that over to uh, to ArcSight, and which can be then processed and used in those correlation and alerting routines. So. Absolutely, these tools are designed to integrate well with other systems that you're going to have in your enterprise. Great, thanks, Jason. Let's see. The next question is Where do the whitelists come from? Do you provide them or do we have to build them? Ted, why don't you take that question? Uh, gladly, Jeff. Uh, yes, yeah, so the whitelists, um, we 
provide as part of the services for delivering the whitelist-based solutions. We'll provide uh, an example starter list just to show uh, the usage and the format. But that the whitelist content, uh, that information comes from the customer. The customer typically already has that information because they've been going through a compliance effort already, and it's just a matter of, of gathering that information and getting it into a, a format that's usable for the tripwire solution. Great. Thanks, Ted. Um, there's one more that's actually related to the whitelist profiler. It says, can the whitelist profiler only be used for ports and services? Jason, can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, as we referenced, this is actually an, a the whitelist profiler is a very flexible, very powerful technology. Um, most of what we saw here, again, was clearly focused on ports and services, but quite well, honestly, that was that's what it was originally built for. But it's expanded quite a bit beyond that as we start looking at how we can leverage this capability. Uh, we can right now we have it already built into our suite to verify local users on a system and the groups and the membership of those groups. That ties back into SIP 3R5. Uh, we can monitor the applications that are installed and the patch level of those applications, which is incredibly beneficial for a SIP 7R3, which talks about how uh, a process to ensure that your applications are kept current and that vendor patches are applied, they're evaluated and they're applied in a, on an ongoing basis. Auditing, uh, the, the, the manual legwork to do that is very challenging, and we have the ability to, um, to do that uh, fairly well, actually. It's, it's a pretty impressive thing. Um, and there's also ways people are using this tool that uh, are not related to, uh, to SIP at all. Uh, we have some folks who are using it to enforce um, the presence or the absence of static routes on their critical systems, on their perimeter. Uh, it's not specifically tied to a SIP requirement, but it's a pretty decent general security practice. So, um, yeah, this, there's, this is still a fairly new technology for us that we've recently developed. It was actually developed in our consulting team uh, working directly with customers. So it's it's very, very focused on being uh, very lean and very targeted um, to solving these specific areas. So we're still learning things about it right now. Um, that said, yeah, there are, there's, there's a, it's going to have a lot of legs. We're going to be seeing a lot more of this uh, development around this tool in the future. Great. Thanks, Jason. Let's see. The next question is, how can I test or know the tripwire agent resource overhead of implementing rules, especially a, a real-time rule? Ted, can you go ahead and address that one? Uh, gladly, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Why don't we drop down a question for us? If, a, if an entity is uh, following the requirements they should, then they'll have a test environment. And a typical rollout process would include uh, implementing in that test environment and going through the steps of, of demonstrating uh, where, if, if there are any performance concerns. Um, we have, uh, so, and then Tripwire, as part of our services team, we bring to the table experience with where, uh, if there are any concerns, where those might be and, and what things tend not to be of issue and can help uh, address. Um, the team's concerns about uh, where those performance issues might be. But uh, for, in, as an example, for real time, I just mentioned a common misconception is that real time is a scanning function and therefore is going to be resource intensive, but it's actually a listening function and is uh, typically is not resource intensive. So just as an example, one of the considerations we would address uh, going through a test phase. Great. Thanks, Ted. Um, while we're answering questions, we're actually going to ask you another question. The question is, how do you think your compliance remediation efforts impact security? And we'll get that launched here. The options are compliance is improving our security posture. Compliance work is having no impact on our security posture. Compliance work is consuming all our resources 
and our security is suffering. And while you guys answer that, we'll go ahead and field some other questions. All right. Uh, let's see. The next question is, hi. If we already have Tripwire Log Center and Tripwire Enterprise, would we have to stop using those completely and purchase this new suite, or is there a way to add that suite on what we already have? Ted, you want to take that question? Yeah, no problem. Um, so this, you certainly do not uh, have to or need to, by any means, abandon what you already have. Uh, these these solutions that were developed uh, primarily in the field are based on the core Tripwire product uh, uh, product uh, offering, and um, so it's it's really an extension uh, of those of those solutions. Great, thanks, Ted. Well, it looks like uh, we're about out of time, so. Uh, I really want to thank you again for attending our webcast. We hope it was informative and provided you insight into passing NERC SIP audits with Tripwire's NERC Solution Suite. If you have any questions um, that weren't answered or if you'd like additional information, please feel free to contact us at the email addresses shown below on the screen. And thanks again, everybody. <laughs>